Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad you're here. Welcome home to St. Peter's. We are starting our October Bible study for 2023. This is a study of the Gospel of Mark. It's a four-week course. So one of the great things about Mark is that it's 16 chapters. So we'll cover four chapters a night. Um, it helps to read the chapters as we get ready for them, but it's not necessary. And my hope is that having had the class You'll either go back and reread the ones that you've already pre-read, or you'll have a chance to read the new ones with a new sense of things. It may be helpful for you to take out your Bibles if you're watching this online, um, and you, know, you can follow along and reference as we go. I won't move too fast through the four chapters. We have a bit of time to talk about them, and, and for those who are actually here in the class, I want to welcome Eileen, Allison, and Amy. Um, if something pops up for you and, and you think, oh, I, I have a question, don't be afraid to uh, to call it out. Um, we really try to emphasize the idea that we're here to, to learn alongside each other. And even though I'm facilitating the class and you know I've got a bit of experience on this side of, of the pulpit, I just want to make sure people feel like this is an accessible piece, uh, group, piece of study that you can take on. So the biggest thing to think about with any Bible study of a gospel is to understand the word itself. Gospel is actually just uh, an English translation of a Greek word, which means good news or a great story. Um, and so the idea behind a gospel is to hear that good word about somebody. Usually there are other gospels of other people out there. There's a gospel of Hercules. There's a gospel of Alexander of Macedonia. We're here to talk about the Gospels of Jesus, and particularly that of Mark. Um, and you may know from having been a, a Sunday school student or gone to church and you've heard the uh, Gospel or announce the passage that's being read, there are four Gospels. You'll see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four evangelists. And again, evangelism is just literally a good word, a sent good word. And so the evangelists, each one of them carry that. They're given personalities uh, and often attributed to particular disciples of Jesus, or in this case, a disciple of Paul. But the core value of who the person is that's telling the story is this is where it gets a little hinky. You have to imagine it's not just one person telling that story. It's a community. So it's the community around uh, that's organized around the way the gospel is told in Matthew, that's really the Matthean community. It's the way the community is organized around that Markan story that uh, is telling that, the gospel of Mark, same as Luke, same as John. And each gospel has its own point that it's trying to make. We're here to talk specifically about Mark. The other thing that I want to give it as a gift to you is uh, I'm in the midst of my doctor of ministry program, and I was given the opportunity and really blessed to be able to participate in a class mm -hmm. on Matthew that took into account the idea of contextual criticism. And my professor described contextual criticism in this way. Within the context of a story, a piece of scripture, you'll notice as you read it, there's kind of a horizon. This is the perspective, the context with which that story is being told. So anytime you pick up a book and start reading it, you're in a place, you're, you're in a, a world of the author's creating or the, a story of the author's telling. And as a result of that, you're kind of seeing it through their eyes. So I want you to imagine, you know, a sunrise or a sunset, or in this case, moonrise, because it's a little later at night, and you're looking out and you see that kind of line of where the horizon is. And above that is the starry sky, and below that is that dark dark outline of, of the houses or the hillside or the trees or what have you. That horizon perspective that Mark is offering us is alongside the one that we have in our lives. So there are, uh, there are four of us here in this virtual class space. There are more of you out there, I hope. And you have your own perspective on this. And it's compounded because if you're watching this with me, you're in this moment. So you're about to be five because here comes Reverend Liz. You're in this moment. But at the same time, you're also receiving, if you're watching this online, through the perspective of the people who are attending. So, you know, it, it spins out a bit. So it's important for us to kind of work on aligning our contexts. 
We have the historic context of, of Mark's gospel and how it was compiled over seven decades and what was really kind of the second half of the first century of the Christian movement, um, that time after the resurrection of Jesus, but really kind of before the the heavy things that happened in the community that broke it in half in terms of uh, the the people who were Christian believers being expelled from Jewish synagogues, as in John, or the framing of the gospel story in context of the Acts of the Apostles, as it was in Luke, or even the idea that in Matthew, there the people in Matthew are trying to, if you will, legitimize the story of Jesus in context with the 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 Jewish law, the scriptures. Ours particularly is one that is very immediate and intense, and it's very much kind of drawn out of the the first stages of what it means to be a a, a religious community of faith. <laughs> And so I want to kind of hold that up to you as you take this on. We're really kind of reading the earliest gospel, and I'm going to put air quotes on that, because there are other sources out there. Uh, there's a there's actually a German word meaning source, which is called quell or kel, and that's the Q document. It's it's fable. You may have heard about that in other classes or in other Bible studies. People refer to the Q document. It's not a secret gospel. It's not some text that's in some vault somewhere. It's that collection of stories that were kept by people and told over and over again in community as they would gather like we are right now on a Tuesday night um, after work, after dinner, and they would tell each other stories about Jesus. These were collected over time and turned into a text. To my knowledge, though, the scholars of the last 1800 years, there are not any more secret or unrevealed gospel stories. I mean, you know. There are some from Nag Hammadi, Gnostic scriptures, and other things like that. But these are all traditions that either grew up alongside Christianity and kind of borrowed from it, or were offshoots of Christianity and kind of took pieces from it. So it's kind of where we are. We're here to, to look at the Gospel of Mark. So if you've got your Bible, you can take that out, take a look at it, and we'll get into it. Okay. But before we do, I'm going to show you what we're going to take on. Week one is going to be the beginning of the good news, literally the beginning of the gospel. And that's how the gospel of Mark begins. It starts off in the beginning, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the story, the son of God. Week two, uh, when we're dealing with the next four chapters, five through eight, we're talking about the question of authority. Who is this Jesus and what is he talking about? Then week three, we kind of turn around and look towards Jerusalem. Jesus is taking his friends on a very intentional journey to Jerusalem and ultimately to the scene of the crucifixion. And then when we get to week four and the site and the time of the crucifixion in the story and to the empty tomb. The interesting thing about this very peculiar gospel is, um, and if you've read ahead a little bit, you may know this, in the gospel of Mark, technically there's no Christmas, and Easter is better represented by a big question mark, because it begins with Jesus sort of appearing out of uh, out of the countryside in Galilee, out of Nazareth, and then we have the gospel story, and at the end, not giving away anything, we come to an empty tomb. What happens next? We don't know yet. Because in the first ending of the Gospel of Mark, the women run away that went to the tomb and are afraid and don't tell anybody anything. Somebody told something because we're talking about the Gospel of Mark today. It was so consternating, they actually added a second ending to it, kind of a kind of a gospel scripture rewrite. And they actually appended a little bit so they can kind of give a, a resurrection narrative. But really, that's kind of interesting how that sets up. Okay, we're ready. Let's pray. The Lord be with you. Also with you. So with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all, all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Chapter 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I am a big fan, grew up with it since I was a kid, of Handel's Messiah. Comfort, comfort ye my people. 
this moment when the words of the prophet are quoted. In this case, we're hearing a, a bit of a, a paraphrase of Isaiah 43, which is really kind of the opening of what's called the book of the consolation of Israel. This is the section of the book of the prophet Isaiah that specifically looks toward the moment when the exile is coming to a close and people are being reminded that they will go home. So much of these chapters, these 15 chapters of Isaiah are all about hope. And ultimately what we're hearing in this gospel and how it starts is hope. The idea here is that um, we're actually starting to experience and we're observing first person point of view, the arrival of the herald of the word of God, the son of God. And uh, one commentator, a guy named Keenan, who's actually uh, a commentator that uses, believe it or not, Mahayana Buddhism to talk about the gospel of Mark. He says that uh, the idea is that it aims to actualize the good news of Mark's readers, uh, not to impart information about Jesus. Like in Matthew, we have a genealogy of Jesus. And in John, you hear about a Jesus who was present at the very creation of the world as the divine Logos. We're not hearing that. We're instead hearing the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the path is straight to us. And I'm not saying, you know, straight to the people of first century Palestine. Quite literally, because the way the gospel is written, it's made for us. So this promise that is being fulfilled by God in the words of the prophet is in the first person. It's to restore Israel to its place in peace, but it's also to do something for us. It's there to foster a conversion experience for us. And as we kind of work our way through towards the end of this Bible study, you'll start to see that Mark is kind of a grand circle. And for us in this life, as we seek to follow God in Christ, one of the things we have to acknowledge is, is that this is not a one and done experience, this idea of conversion. Instead, we're kind of always in this point of renewal, this present moment understanding. We can't say I was converted back in 1985 on June 4th. Um, and we can't say I plan to be converted on July 3rd in 2028. Um, we can only be in the present moment. And, and that's the challenge, <laughs> you know, that's where we're stuck. So to be into this moment, and this is the tough piece because we tend in the West to be pretty linear. We have to kind of let that go. You know, we're, 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 we're having to let go of that linear sense. And even though we're in it, because this is a four week Bible study and this is week one and we're in chapter one and you can keep creating all these sequences until, you know, you keep until you reach the end. The idea here is that once we get to the end, we're going to start over. Once we get to this point of conclusion, we begin again and we renew. Um, Eileen, you, you just finished the Camino. I was on pilgrimage in North England this earlier this year. You know, in many ways, when you reach the end of your pilgrimage, that's when your journey starts. Not just to get home, but because now you get to take all those experiences you've had, <laughs> integrate them into the journey you have in front of you, and then continue. So the promise is this smooth straight way and yet we're going to go out into the transjordan to meet a prophet who is not coming from that smooth straight place instead he's coming from the place of wildness of of the of the of the wilderness and uh you know, i'm gonna throw some greek words at you and soon one of the interesting things about um the, mm. the ideas that are being presented in Mark and also the context of the Greek that it's written in is there are these idiomatic concepts that when, when the word is said, uh, it, it is, it is immediately felt like for instance, uh, a nuanced word in English, um, cold. So this is one for you guys to answer. What do you, what do you, what do you feel when you hear the word cold? Shivers. Shivers. Right? What other? What else do you feel? Sometimes you feel recoil. I mean, cold can be an, a gesture as well, can mm -hmm. it? Cold can be an action. Like that person's yes. that person did that was so cold that they did that. Mm -hmm. right? I feel so, like the frozen kind of frozenness, like stone, just like shut down. 
Right. So, so in that context, when we hear the word wilderness um, in Greek, eremon, you know, people can feel that dry wind. People can feel that that barrenness, that desiccation, that dust, that gravel, you know, gravelliness underfoot, the uneven ground, the you know, the thorns and the sticks and the twigs and the bugs and the, all that. You know, when you hear that, you know, when when John appears on the edge of the wilderness in the Transjordan. Oh my, you know, something is happening. And on top of that, as he's described, he's wearing, you know, a camel hair and a and uh, and and some rough leather around his waist and he's eating locusts and wild honey and all these things. Like, you know, people are having very strong reactions to that and yet they've come out to be baptized, to be cleansed, to be prepared because he's saying mm-hmm. prepare, there is one who is coming and you have to be ready to meet him. Uh, so they're in that wild place. They're in that uh, in that flowing river, or we should say with Jordan, the trickling river. Um, they're getting their sins washed away. Uh, the idea of a mikvah, you know, you're washing away your uncleanliness, you're confessing your sins, and they're signifying that they're open to God's judgment. John's pointing to a baptism, though, that is coming with the Holy Spirit. And it's a kind of communion with God. And this is the moment when Jesus appears on the scene. Now, the interesting thing here is that we don't get um, a herald, if you will, that we're accustomed to. So, for instance, in Matthew, we have um, we have an angel appearing to Joseph in a dream. We have uh, we have the Magi following a star in Luke. We have multiple stories of the angels of God, Gabriel in particular, who are traveling to people to introduce them to the fact that a a child of miraculous birth, both John the Baptist and Jesus are about to be born. And then, of course, the entire host of heaven, all the angels show up to sing a a choir offering uh, for uh, for the shepherds in the field, terrifying them and then sending them off to find the baby Jesus lying in a manger. None of that happens. We have a man who appears like a face in the crowd and he's singled out for our attention and he's baptized and then the heavens are opened and he hears descending on him and sees and descending on him the spirit like a dove and he hears the voice that says, behold, this is my son, the beloved, and that's one I am well pleased. And then he's driven into the wilderness, that Aramon before. The interesting thing about Mark, and this is, again, that that guy Keenan talking about this, is that you have a gospel story that always kind of dances, especially in these first eight chapters, on the edge of chaos. You know, where is Jesus interacting, intersecting with us? On the edge of the wild. So he's interacting with John in the wilderness. He's out in the wilderness being tempted. Um, And... In the midst of this, um, he's also getting ready to form a community <clears throat> around him. So the idea here is, is looking at where that ragged line is. And we're going to confront that all the way through. We're going to confront that right now in the wilderness. Eventually, we'll confront it by the Sea of Galilee. We'll confront it in the storm on the sea. We'll confront it in the crowd. That is uh, that is just like a crashing wave against him and the people. He, they become their own character. You know, they they are faceless, n- numerous, um, massive cloud of witnesses that are gathered, always pressing in. So the death, the, the idea that there's this dance between order and chaos, and Jesus is that intersection point. Pay attention to that. This is also the power of a page turner. Uh, <laughs> so, for instance, in Matthew and in Luke. The interaction between Jesus and the tempter is is kind of scripted, right? Can anyone recall what those are? Jesus is hungry, so the devil tells him, take these stones and make bread. Make bread out of stones. Yeah. Um, Then uh, he takes them to to the pillar, to the tip of the temple mount, and says, throw yourself down because... Because if you were, your father would save you. If right. Were, yeah. Yeah. It's said in the scriptures, you he will not let your foot strike a stone. And and then because this is the biggest one of all, you know, 
the devil shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, if you'll bow down and worship me, I have the power to do what? To give these all to you, right? So we don't get any of that <laughs> in Mark. We get, he was driven into the wilderness for 40 days and tempted by the devil and angels ministered to him. That's all we get. And then he comes back. You know, the, the idea here, and this is another thing that I'll point you to in the gospel stories, pay very close attention at whatever gospel you read to how lists and descriptive images are used. So 40 days tempted by Satan with the wild beast and angels ministered to him. Go to Matthew and you can look at the list of the genealogy. Um, go to go to go to John and you can see the the way the Greek kind of moves rhetorically one point to another and feeds in on how God, you know, Jesus was with the creator as the word kind of being said. The other thing here, and this is one of those big pieces, is that you're always hearing God and, and Jesus also, if you will, speaking in the present tense or intending to the present tense. Remember, um, Mark is really the gospel of now. And this is probably one of the hardest things for us. Remember when I talked about that contextual horizon, as we seek to align this, Part of the exercise for us is really perceiving the gospel of Mark as, as our present moment. You know, we're there, we're in the midst of it. We're in the muck with Jesus. The other thing that's interesting about the idea of angel, I'm going to step back for a second and go to John. Um, so we hear about Gabriel in the other gospels, right? The interesting thing is, is that John is actually God's messenger in this one. And the, the old Hebrew word for this um, is uh, is a ma male male ak, uh, the sending of God. Angelos is the Greek word, and the idea here is that whether it's a person or a divine uh, celestial type being, there are people who are vested with carrying uh, God's intention, being the guide in this case. John is this person, which is important because when we get to the middle part of chapter one and jesus is getting ready to come back from the wilderness and start to assemble his community the first thing we read about is of course john being arrested um he is now no longer free and and we're we're confronted with the fact that with the herald gone now the action if you will falls to the hands of the one who has been baptized been tempted and now returned to declare that the, the kingdom of God is at hand. So there are very two important words that are offered up. And these are the earliest ones that we hear of calling in the gospel. And that is, follow me. Uh, that's very important. Follow me, Jesus says to, uh, to Simon and to Andrew, to James and to John, and then later to Levi in the first chapter. Come follow me. The interesting thing is that when he confronts these four fishermen by the Sea of Galilee, uh, just as much as the, the desert, the wilderness is a wild, chaotic place, uh, so also is the sea, the Paline. Um, this is a very wild and chaotic place, particularly in Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a very changeable inland sea. The yes. weather can change, I am told, in, a, in, in the blink of an eye. And uh, it's not a very safe place. You have to be a very experienced mariner. So who would Jesus go to to call the first disciples? But those who are most experienced, if you will, on dwelling on the edge of chaos. So he turns to Peter and he turns to Andrew and he turns to James and John. He says, come follow me. But the interesting thing is that he's doing this in context with their lives, not with his. He doesn't say to them, come follow me and I will make you a framer of houses. His father was a, a carpenter, a techne, a person who could do all technical things. Come follow me and I'll help you hang a header beam over a door. He says, come follow me and I will make you fish for people. So he's speaking directly to these, these uh, persp prospective disciples in their context. They literally leave their nets to follow him. So uh, as you ponder your own livelihood, um, and this is another moment I'll pause and ask you guys to respond. Can you relate to it, to a Jesus who would confront you and say, come follow me and I will make you dot, dot, dot for people. You know, the idea of, of, of casting down your own earthly net and taking up this spiritual one. Can you, what would that be like to be confronted with a Jesus who does, who says that to you?
I'm a priest of the church. It would terrify me. <laughs> I'll be honest. You know, I mean, even in the context of of it, just the idea of of, of stepping away from the very things that by which I I, if you will, make my living, um, is is unnerving. It it kind <laughs> of reminds me. I know we've talked about like jonah jonah just showing up on the beach and it's kind of like it's similar feeling of like who is this person and what are they asking me to do like what's going on here mm -hmm. it's like there's 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 a very important word and you just nailed this liz is like eschatology like what's the end game here you know it's okay to have these proposals in front of me but what's what's the outcome i mean I've got mouths to feed. I've got people to care for. I've got bills to pay. And you're asking me to, to flip around and take this on. This is a little terrifying. Noah and the Ark. Noah and the Ark. Build me an Ark. Mm -hmm. I want it this big by this big by this big. Yeah. Make it out of gopher it wood. Locked, got everybody in. Right. And yeah, you had to go against uh, community. We're making fun of him, harassing him. Yeah. Yeah. Moses and Aaron, you know. God says, God says to the people of Israel, I've heard your suffering, you know, mm -hmm. leave everything that you know for generations and, and walk Abraham out into the and desert Isaac. and follow me. What's that, Amy? I said Abraham and Isaac, right? Where he's told to sacrifice his son. Oh, it's, it's on, you know, we're starting to put it in context. You start to hear these, these powerful mm -hmm. things. The other piece of this, and this is the, the, the eschatology piece. It's, you know, a lot of people think of this as as how will it be at the end of days? Well, we're, we're always, if you will, eschatology is actually, again, back to the present moment is if the kingdom of God is here, then now is the time we need to react to it. He, this is the present moment. I'm not going to get another opportunity um, to make an active choice other than the one I'm making in the present moment. And again, this kind of emphasizes this need and this sort of poking at us with the chapter one of Mark of this idea of conversion being an ongoing experience. Like it's going to challenge us. It's going to, it's going to unnerve us. Uh, I'll use, I'll use today's experience at hand. I, I had an issue with my internet. I had, luckily I'm on now. You can see if I had an issue with my internet, I had to go get another internet box from the store. Um, I was wearing black pants, my black clergy shirt, my white collar, but I'm standing there in the store waiting to be helped by the attendant. And they're all wearing black pants and black shirts, by the way. And a lady walks up to me and asks me to fix her phone. You know, I, you know, I, I didn't have any, I, I couldn't say that's not me because that would have been rude. I said, well, ma'am, I'm sorry. I'm actually a priest and uh, I'd have, be happy to bless it. But I think you're gonna have to wait for one of the attendants. And because she really wasn't keyed into what she needed to do, I also, before the attendant helped me, I made sure that he signed her in. So she'd be next after me to get some help. But, you know, it's, again, it's the idea, are we willing to invest in the now? And that's what Jesus is really calling us to. So the calling of the disciples is all about being summoned to join in something. So to engage in binding our being to a relational uh, experience that is going to deepen and transform us. You know, one of the things that's being stressed in these first moments of, of conversion and experience of the Son of God is this is a conversion that's going to happen and be sustained in community. We're going to be a part of something. The other thing that's interesting about this is that as we start to move into the healings and a couple other events, Jesus tells the people who are recipients of these blessings to go and not tell anybody about it. So one of my teachers always emphasized that this is the secret of the gospel story. We're we're being invited to to take on mm -hmm. some special knowledge. You know, the, in the in the old days, um, the the cults and the religions of of the Hellenic culture and the Roman Empire, there were an awful lot of these religions that were highly invested in in mysteries and you were as you as you increased in the uh in in the practice of the religion as you were as you were progressing in it you'd be initiated into deeper and deeper mysteries um we kind of draw the line of the secret of the gospel story and mark is you know we hold this this story and we share it if you will as a precious gem to others but it isn't a restrictive thing because clearly 
you know, it's been written down, it's been published, we have it, you know, to share with other people, we can tell the story. I have a good friend of mine who's an actor who does the entire gospel as a performance. We had him come here uh, right as the pandemic was ending to perform it, Frank Runyon. So, you know, this idea of us being uh, being led into these demonstrations of gospel life is also to make them open, open us up and, and, and help us to claim them more fully. As Jesus moves in chapter one from calling his disciples into what's going to become his earthly ministry, he's in Capernaum, Peter's, Peter's town, his hit town, one of the towns where he was living and working and moving, um, Jesus was, and he's taken to Peter's home and he meets uh, Peter's mother-in-law who is sick in bed and uh, he takes her by the hand and she's healed and she gets up and she cooks and, and the family has a meal in the midst of those encounters in Capernaum though, he also encounters a man who is leprous, who has a severe skin infection. And the man says to him, if you will it, uh, you can heal me. And Jesus says, I do. And he is, you know, th these are not advanced formulaic, incantational healings these are these are sort of abrupt uh they're touch based they're they're intimate the only time we really experience uh anything other than that in this moment is that there's a man with an unclean spirit and the spirit cries out to jesus and he silences it and again casts it out you get the sense that the, there's a physicality to jesus in this in this in this healing arc in this narrative it kind of strikes us there's a wonderful another one of those greek words dunamis, you know, dyna dynamism, dynamic, you know, that sort of powerful energy that, that sort of connects to people and connects people and, and gets things, you know, it churns the waters, if you will, it gets us, it gets us going. So there's an awful lot going on here that we get a chance to experience. But the biggest thing here is that the minute something starts to happen and, uh, you know, we're human beings, <laughs> You know, we're all susceptible to celebrity, uh, current culture, you know, events. Someone, someone on the news today was saying, isn't it great that the NFL is getting a bump in ratings because Taylor Swift is dating, uh, dating one of the Kelsey brothers? Um, you know, it is what it is. Um, but uh, but the crowd, the Okloy, the, 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 the mass of humanity, they start to press in. So much so that Jesus can't find that quiet space anymore. One of my favorite images of this is the healing of the paralytic. Um, partly because when I was a kid, I had an illustrated Bible. And I, I always loved this. This is one of my favorite pictures to look at. I love busy pictures where I have to pick things out and find details in them. You know, the Where's Waldo books, they, they were after I was a child. But, you know, even as an adult, I like those. Um, the find an object hunting games. Those are great things. And the pick. It was I spy in our I like spy. The I spy books. <laughs> so you, you can relate. Yeah. So, so I always loved, I always loved that one because the, the one picture I remember it had so many faces in it, peering in from windows and doors. And, you know, I swear there must've been somebody kind of hiding under one of the reed mats on the floor and peeking out. I mean, there was, there was humanity pressing in on him in this little house um, and in the midst of this, and he's healing all these people, they, the, there's a group of people that carry a friend to him on a, on a, on a mat, on a, on a stretcher, and they can't get to the door, much less get inside. So they climb up and remove the roof. Um, they remove the roof and then they lower him down. This is, this is shocking, um, everybody. And this gets us to another way that Mark really makes, uh, makes an incredible amount of, of attentional energy for us to sort of heed and, and take note. You know, this is a Jesus who, who shocks us, who, who, who unseats our easy expectation of the world, who, who even, even when he's not involved in making decisions, he's engaged with people who are willing to do anything to get to a point of intersectionality, to connect with that promise of God, the promise of healing, the promise of life, um, the promise of hope. Luke talks a lot about justice. Matthew talks a lot about authority. Mark seems to focus, really dial in on the idea of hope. So literally, if you can't get to hope, you remove the roof and lower your friend down. And uh, and that's great. 
But the other piece of this, which is wonderful, and this is where we start to get a little bit of negative attention on Jesus, is that he looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven. And it just is, un I mean, you know, people are like, what? What are you talking about? You know, you, know, you, you think it's, you know, I, you were expecting me to say, get up, take your mat and go. And and if I can do that, then 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 why not this? Why not this? Why couldn't I forgive sins? Take your mat and go. A man takes his mat and goes. But what it hits us is, is there's a vulnerability and an edginess to Jesus that that undoes us, that challenges us. Um, and, and it also, it also, if you will, it kind of disintegrates the crowd because a crowd, a group of people have to think as a, as a unit, we have to give up a bit of our ability to, to process from our own perspectives, our own experiences, what's actually happening in front of us. Crowds tend to have to rely on, on the perception of the whole, which is not always accurate. In fact, it never is. And so as a result, what is happening is literally is as people start to observe and and the group draws conclusions about him, he keeps breaking it apart. Levi is a great example. He says to Levi, who's sitting at the tax collector booth on the edge of the sea. So he's an unfavorable person. Nobody likes the tax collectors in those ancient days. They see them as sinners. They see them as bad people. They see them as pushed to the margins. And by the way, Matthew's office is literally on the edge of the sea, that place of chaos. He he says, come follow me, and then goes and eats dinner at his house with other tax collectors and sinners. You know, this Jesus of Mark, the one who comes uh, in the name of God as the son of God, you know, the one whose way we are supposed to straighten out and make a smooth path, uh, he's making it a little hard for us to follow him. There have been many times in ministry and life, and maybe you've experienced this too, where you know you present something to someone that 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 seems like the best idea for uh, a, a faithful and faith-filled uh, resolution of a challenge, and they look at you and they ju it just doesn't land, right? It it doesn't it doesn't compute, connect to everything they've known in the past, and in fact. Um, instead of embracing this this path forward, you see them pulling back and, and really withdrawing from the ability to connect to it because it, it may involve them being in relationship with people that they don't they they don't they can't fathom being in relationship to. Um, it may mean a, a language they can't connect to. It may mean a, a cultural practice that seems edgy to them and they just can't wrap their mind around it. Uh, you know that that's that's the challenge is the question, um, that Jesus is, is asked of the fasting and, and, you know, why do your disciples eat while John's disciples fasted, uh, you know, and he talks about, you don't put new cloth on an old cloak, it'll tear. You don't put new wine into old wineskins because they'll burst. This is a new thing. The, the plucking and the eating of grain on the Sabbath, doing work on the Sabbath. I mean, he's healing on the Sabbath, but he's also getting food on the Sabbath. You know, who is this Jesus? Who is this rule breaker? It's got to be consternating for folks. So, you know, this this Jesus is not just this sort of uh I'm trying, what's the word I'm looking for? He's he's not just this sort of sort of easy, easy, easy walk person. He's he's not somebody you can just kind of wander with. He's gonna challenge you. And that's where we get into trouble. So the the aspect of Jesus uh beginning to engage the religious authorities, you know, he's his teachings on earth start to exceed what we can embrace, what we already know and accept is true about heavenly things. You know, there's the debate about work on the Sabbath. Um, there's this idea of earthy versus earthly power, you know, that, 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 that uh, one of the things I was once, uh, I was once uh, hearing someone described as, uh, you know, they're, they're a very polarizing personality because when they teach, they, they challenge to such an extent that it overcomes uh, people's comfort levels. They, they stop to be able to hear them clearly. And instead they just are starting to hear their own reactions. So that healing on the Sabbath can ex exacerbate the conflict over the plucked grain. Um, there are too many people. Remember the, the, the you know, Jesus's dynamism keeps drawing more people in all the time. And, and, and on the edge of that, of the Okloy, the crowd, people start to have opinions and talk about it. You know, it's the 
Um, those of you who watch Ted Lasso or you enjoy, you know, like football on TV or things like that, there's always the halftime show or there's always the, 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 the between the games report where the commentators who have a deep experience of whatever sport it is, come on and they make comments about the performances they've just seen and what they think should happen in the next interval. They, they talk about players as if they're in their heads uh, they talk about coaches and the choices they're making. Everybody's trying to second guess and figure out what happens next. And uh, and the debate rises is how is he doing these things? Is he doing them with with the 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 uh, the, the fallen things of this world? Or is he doing it with with er that earthy kind of uh, spiritual power, transactional with the spirits? Is he getting? Is it is it is it uh, is it other gods, other demons, other other things? Or is there something heavenly about it um, that, 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 you know, tell us what it is. And Jesus won't say anything. He says, you know, a house divided itself against itself. It cannot stand. If I'm doing acts of healing and I'm using the power of, of the evil thing, the evil one to do this, the accuser, it, it, it's, it's a no go. It's not going to, it's not going to equate. The other challenge is um, the idea that uh, with Jesus's, family showing up and see your mothers and, you, and your brothers are out here your, your siblings are out here you know come out to them and jesus saying no my family's here uh one of my uh new testament professors she wrote a wonderful book i highly recommended it to you recommend it to you it's deirdre goods jesus's family values and family values are a big thing nowadays in the socio-political discourses that are out there in the world in here for us the idea of jesus's family values he takes 12 disciples and appoints them, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, representing a diversity of, of people from many different families being drawn into one place. And on top of that, you can see from that icon uh, at the top of the illustration there, it's women and it's men and it's children too. It's, it's, the, whole, it's the whole camp following, if you will. So the idea of, of a nuclear family that we've been so invested with in our culture for so long is kind of exploded by Jesus saying, you know, these are my brothers and my sisters. Listen, these are my mothers and my fathers, you know, come follow me and be a part of this, this family that's growing by spiritual grounds, not by others. So you know, it, it, again, I, I don't think we give Mark credit enough that in a just three short chapters, He's basically polarized us and, and challenged us to expand and explode our, the way we think about relationships, the way we organize community, the way we exist in family and, and struggle to figure out what does inclusion look like. It challenges us. So we're getting towards the end of this, and I just want to hold up. Is there any, any questions or any observations that popped up? I am going fast and furious through these four chapters. I don't want to go so fast that I lose someone. Is there a particular bit from these early stories that, that you find to be a favorite one um, before I get into talking about parables? My favorite one is the withered hand, if I have to share it. It's, it's, it's the story of the man in the synagogue with a withered hand who's healed on the Sabbath. The idea that Jesus would heal someone on the Sabbath is, is alarming. But what do we use our hands for? Everything. All the work we could possibly do, we need our hands. And when he is able to stretch out his hand, he is able to labor again. Whereas before he was he was literally... He was literally, you know, handicapped. He could not use a hand. He was limited to one, whether it was his dominant or his non-dominant, we don't know. We know that it was withered. It was injured. It wouldn't work. And being told to stretch it out and to find it whole, um, you know, that's both miraculous and remarkable, but also challenging to us because you're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. That's my favorite. Does anyone else have one? <laughs> <clears throat> all right parables i love parables because they vex me parables are an interesting form of teaching they're they're a way of telling a story where everybody can get the context and understand it because it's common language it's common ideas practices it's something people can relate to um, and at the same time, 
they're told in such a way and they can be retold over and over and over again. And they continue to teach us and inform us because the minute we think we get them figured out, another wrinkle shows up. So uh, so the idea behind this is, is that the power of a parable to teach is that it, it causes us to look and fail to perceive to listen but fail to understand um, it keeps us out of a, a false or a cheap sense of metanoia you know our aha moment is not going to be easily won we have to we have to really kind of chew on and digest and and then redo it's you know it's yeah with the beginning of this class we talked about the uh, the need to read mark learn and inwardly digest the scriptures and not that I'm, you know, saying that you should tear the page out of your Bible and make a snack of it tonight. Have an oatmeal cookie instead. But the idea behind this is to is to take these these stories as they're told, and and literally let them let them work on you. You know, Let's take some time with them, ponder them, and it, it takes some time. So in this chapter, chapter four, um, we get the parable of the sower. You know, everything that Jesus is doing up until now. He's scattering seeds for the for the kingdom of God. Um, we get the lamp under the bushel. You know, once you have a light, you don't hide it. You set it up where it can do it the most good. Uh, the mustard seed. You know, the smallest seed makes the biggest bush. A bush so big that uh, that uh, the birds of the air come and make their nests in it. This year, my wife and I planted Mexican sunflower seeds, and they are small seeds. They're 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 very small. We had a Mexican sunflower plant that was nine feet high and eight feet wide. And it was so big, it actually was starting to eclipse everything else in the garden bed with it. So we had to remove it. It was too big, but that little tiny seed made a big plant. And everybody can say, oh, I can relate to that. But then, you know, how do you continue to apply that to your life? There are other parables that mark phrases that are actually, you know, sort of IRT in real time parables. So the parable of the storm, we'll get that one, and the storm being stilled. Um, those are those are important as well. And then when we get to the garrison demoniac next week, you'll hear more about those real time teachings. But let's go back to the sower. You know, the seeds. Uh, when Jesus says a sower goes out to sow seeds. Everybody knows what that looks that looks like. It's it's a man or a woman with a sack of seed at their hip, and they reach into that sack and they they have a very practiced throw where they lift up their hand and fling the seed in a pattern, and that seed falls upon a, a field that's been plowed and cut and prepared for planting. Um, but it's a broadcast experience, and so you know though you may release the seed with intention, it's going to fall where it will. You guys remember where the seed falls? Falls on the path, falls on rocky ground, falls among thorns and weeds. Uh, it falls on on good soil, and there's there's a concomitant result to each of those things. And because he's telling that story in that way, and people can in their mind's eye see it because they have seen it before, they understand what it is. Then when he, if you will, hits us with the punchline. Um, and luckily, because we're along with the disciples sitting with him afterwards, he breaks it open a bit and does a little bit of exegesis for us. But it still challenges us. The kingdom of God is like, and then that story hits and lands. It's like a lamp being lit at night. Do you put it under a bushel basket or do you set it on a stand so that people can see it? How do you approach having something that's illuminating in your life? Do you hide it away or do you share that light? And it's for everybody in the room. Once you light a candle, you can't say, oh, this is my candle. It's only my light. You, you can't have any of it. No, you've got to share it with everybody who's there. Um, the mustard seed, again, you know, I think it's one of the top 10 hits. People want to see it in all the greatest hits of Jesus albums. You know, it's, you know, people have it made into jewelry, a little mustard seed and in, in, in a, in a little piece mm -hmm. of quartz or something like that. But the idea Sunday here, school, I feel like one of the Sunday school classics too. One of the, yeah, absolutely. So in that context, you know, we're, we're there, but as they were able to hear it, that's the important line that Mark talks about. So remember, and as we get close to the end of this lesson, I'm going to remind you is that almost all along the way, 
as they were able to hear it, as people were able to absorb it, as, as it happened in that moment, it always kind of points us back. If this is going too fast for you, go back, re review, renew this, you know, like, you know, realize what we've just done. It, we've taken maybe a few days out of Jesus's life or a few weeks, but we have come from the voice of one crying out in the wilderness to the mustard seed is the smallest seed. And yet when it's planted, it grows and, and it matures into a bush so big that it, it provides a hundredfold of a harvest of itself. And on top of that, it feeds the birds of the air, feeds the people around it, makes good mustard to spice your dishes. I mean, this, this parable action is so powerful because it continue to, continues to break us open. This is kind of where we are as we get close to the end of this one hour class and we experienced the first four chapters. Um, hold on to these things and, and think about them as we go. Um, we're going to head out now and uh, finish up, but I just want to point to the next section. We're going to go cover chapters five to eight. And I love this one. Demoniacs, death <laughs> and defilement. You know, just so you know, this drama story is about to get a whole lot crazier and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. So um, it's been great to have you with us. If you are watching this later. Question. Yes. I have please. a question. Sure. The, the sower parable. Um, uh -huh. In Go chapter, what, chapter four, yeah. Verse chapter 11, four. The secret of the kingdom of God. Can you explain that a little bit? The um, They may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Ever hearing, never understand. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Right. So, um, an interesting little bit here. I'm going to look down into my Bible and see where this this pops up. The interesting thing here is that it's kind of referring back to something um, in. It's both, you know, kind of a callback to Isaiah. Isaiah was a very popular scroll back in the day um, of Mark's of Mark's community, and. The idea of this kind of harsh view, you know, people can see and not perceive, hear and not understand, is an idea that that there's a there's a provocation in it for us to understand that we are called to conversion. In other words, you know, you're going to hear the story and you probably won't get it at first. So keep keep working on it, you know, and and. And the other piece of it is this is not algebra. Like, you know, there you can't solve for X when it comes to a parable because, um, you know, I remember one of my professors said, you know, every element of a parable is us. So we're the seed or we're the sower or we're the bag holding the seed or we're the bird flying down to the path to snatch it up and take it away or we're the thorn choking that that seeds growth or we're the sun beating down i mean you can find different ways or sometimes we're the good soil and sometimes we're a nourishing rain and sometimes we're the good harvest and, you know there's always a way to play with these parables and chew on them and work on them so that we're continually growing and at the same time, and this is the piece that's very difficult to me because all of us are in this mindset, is that we can get caught in the idea that we have to figure it out. Like there's actually a solution to this when really it's about a relationship. It's a relationship to the text and to the witness. It's a relationship to the teaching. It's also, and, and I love that uh, Liz brought this up about mustard seeds it's about the the Sunday school experience, if you will. You know, one of the things that most of us loved about Sunday school and at the same time found frustrating is that we were always dancing with our ignorance. Like we were, we were, we were learning, but there was always, it always felt like there was so much more to learn, <clears throat> you know, and, and we were never going to get to the end. And yet, even, even with the most familiar Bible stories there, there's always a moment when, when we hear something we didn't hear before. Um, and you know, that's, that's that piece. So rather than thinking about it as, as kind of being branded as ignorant, I always think of it as, and, and we've all talked about this is because I remember having conversation with you, conversation with you on Good Friday about this, you know, every time we hear the, the passion story, depending on which one we're hearing, we always hear something new. We always hear something that we hadn't quite heard in the same way before. Because we're always coming to that story, which is the same story year after year. We come to that story as different people. 
so you know it's you know it, again this is this is that mark and circle continually turning you know we're having this experience and then we're going back to the beginning and back to the beginning you know starting over we're learning as we go and we're always relearning um and that's the there's there's no there's no there's no completion there's fullness but there's no completion of this journey so which is kind of disheartening in some ways because a lot of people say no wait i i just want to take the test and be done can i just take the test and be done <laughs> just give me the blue book i'll do it <laughs> but it doesn't quite work that way so any other questions we got we got another minute or so that was a good one amy thank you I want to talk about Handel's Messiah. You brought that up. <laughs> so, well, so, but, but Handel's Messiah is important because, yeah. you know, if you're a person who grew up with that, the, oh, I sang it. <laughs> you sang it. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that you can't, you can't yeah. soprano. hear, yeah. yeah you can hear the, 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 those scripture readings and not yeah. hear the choir and not hear the oratorio begin and not hear the strings and and the um, harpsichord that's what is it being in the audience as the audience is the choir the yep chorus. and then everybody and stands up and sings out loud but everybody that, has their part you, your boyfriend can be a bass baritone yeah. and you're a high soprano and, and i think and 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 allison you nailed it because when it comes to mark that's mm -hmm. the key is that yep. you know we may be observers in other gospels but Mark specifically, intentionally makes us a player in the drama. Yeah, yeah. So you've got the soprano line. I'll take the baritone. We'll get a couple people to 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 take the tenors. We've got some altos here. We can make it all work. Okay. You make it work. <laughs> we'll practice would be great. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Appreciate your presence. It was wonderful. Um, if you are watching this after the fact online, please like and subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications. We appreciate your time and your energy with us. And of course, if you want to join us again, join us next week. We'll cover, as I said before, chapters five through eight. Y'all take care. God bless. Have a great evening. Bye now. Very enjoyable, Father. Thank you very much. Very enjoyable. <laughs>